Welcome to JBJS's first audio cast. My name is Chad Kruger, Deputy Editor of Social Media for JBJS. The topic of this audio cast is surgical approaches and hip replacement. What does the evidence say? Over the next 30 minutes, you will hear a webinar that was recorded and delivered live to over 500 orthopedic professionals around the world. At the end of this audio cast, you are welcome to view the full webinar on the JBJS YouTube media channel. The hip replacement webinar was moderated by Dr. James Waddell, Deputy Editor of JBGS and an orthopedic surgeon at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. The discussion focuses on different approaches to hip replacement by presenting recent evidence about five different surgical approaches to total hip arthroplasty. During the end of the discussion, you will also hear the question and answer session between the speakers and the attendees. Let's begin. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, our work tonight on this webinar. My financial disclosures are listed there and are not relevant to this particular topic. I also want to thank our partnering institutions and my co-authors in this, those uh, authors from Ortho Carolina and Rothman Institute who were instrumental in uh, uh, providing this data and uh, that culminated in the work that you'll see here. So I think we would all agree that the direct anterior approach has been marketed uh, pretty intensely. There's certainly been over the last five to 10 years a surge in patient awareness and demand rapid surgeon adoption, and there's been reports of numerous benefits. Uh, there are documented limitations, including learning curve and a challenging femoral exposure, and our question was really to assess, are we introducing any potential risks with the proliferation of this new and innovative approach? I think one of the things we noted that really spurred the, uh, the study was that failure of modern cementless femoral implants is relatively rare until we started seeing it recently in some of our revision practices. And so we really thought a scientific inquiry should really be initiated by a thoughtful clinical observation, and we were seeing one, so we decided to undertake this study. And the study purpose was to determine whether failure mechanisms in total hip arthroplasty were related to surgical approach. So here's the uh, paper that will be discussed. And as, uh, as Jim mentioned, it's the risk factor, whether risk factors um, for uh, cementless total hip arthroplasty, femoral aseptic loosening were related to approach. So the methods, there were three high volume academic centers, a retrospective review of almost 500 consecutive early revisions, and early means between the index arthroplasty and five years, and those that were performed between 2011 and 2014. The primary surgical approach, the time to revision, and the failure etiology were documented. There were some exclusions. In 13, the primary surgical approach was unknown. There was one femoral revision for bisphosphonate stress fracture, and then 97 failures were excluded because they were metal modular neck corrosion and adverse local tissue reaction, and obviously negated being included in failure mechanisms uh, from surgical approach. So that left us with a final sample of 342 total arthroplasties, 54% female, and the average age was about 62 years. You'll see there were some demographic differences. The average BMI, the direct anterior approach probably had a slight bias in being selected for thinner patients. There had a smaller BMI than the other two groups, which was statistically significant. In the door classification system, interestingly, those in the direct lateral approach had a greater percentage of type uh, A bone. And then finally, the average time to revision, direct anterior approach, slight difference with uh, earlier time to revision than the other two groups. So when we look at this pie chart, looking at the proportion of revisions by primary surgical approach, you'll see that the red is the direct anterior, the blue, direct lateral, and the green posterior approach. So not too dissimilar and no difference really between the two. When we look at the failure mechanisms and break it down by proportion of those particular mechanisms we're looking at, I want to call particular attention to those outlined there, which was femoral paraprosthetic fracture, femoral component aseptic loosening, acetabular fracture, acetabular loosening, and instability. We obviously are not going to discuss the uh, infection. It's probably not related to surgical approach. <clears throat> we certainly didn't find any differences in this study. And then uh, ceramic fracture was such a small proportion, we wanted to focus on those uh, circled above. So when you look at early periprosthetic fracture or femoral component loosening, there were 112 of those. And when you broke those out by surgical approach, you will see that 51% of those failures were in the direct anterior approach and 35% were in the direct lateral approach and a smaller percentage in the posterior approach. And that was statistically significant across all three groups. Interesting when you look at acetabular component loosening, 
We could not find or fracture. We could not find a difference between the groups because it was insufficiently powered. But you'll see there were some differences with the direct lateral approach having a smaller percentage of acetabular failure. When you look at instability and dislocation, not surprising to see the posterior approach has 48% uh, of the uh, of the instability cases were done through the posterior approach, as as is known with the, the Achilles heel of that approach, if you will. But surprisingly, 38% of uh, the cases were performed through the direct anterior approach, and certainly a smaller number in the direct lateral approach, and that was statistically significant. Apologize for the busy slide. It's, it's found in the article, but I want to highlight a few things about the patient demographics uh, to you that we mentioned a little bit earlier. You see the mean BMI was, uh, at revision was different between the direct anterior approach and the other approaches being slightly smaller in the direct anterior approach. You'll see that the door classification system was different, as mentioned earlier, as with a greater per, uh, percentage of patients having a door class A in the direct lateral approach. And then finally, femoral stem type, which was a little bit of note, as you would imagine, looking at the different types of stems, there was a greater <clears throat> percentage of the tapered webs, wed, uh, wedge stems used in the direct lateral approach, which was statistically significant as well. When we look at the proportions of the mechanisms of early failure by primary surgical approach, we'll highlight those that were significant. When we looked at M early femoral periprosthetic fracture or loosening together, it became significant that a greater percentage of those revised were through the direct anterior approach. However, the significance was really driven by aseptic loosening, not so much by periprosthetic fracture, although you can see the numbers there, certainly greater, but did not reach statistical significance. Interesting, when you look at acetabular periprosthetic fracture loosening, greater incidence of loosening, albeit in very small numbers, but a greater incidence of loosening seen in the posterior approach uh, group. <clears throat> and then finally, when looking at instability, the direct anterior and the posterior approach were nearly equivalent, but both had greater incidence within, those, within that subgroup compared to the direct uh, lateral approach which uh, fewer were revised uh, through that approach. So certainly this study has limitations. I think those are rather obvious. It's a retrospective review. It doesn't take into account regional or geographical variation that can, that can occur with the direct anterior approach. And certainly it didn't take into account the learning curve potential. And finally, the biggest limitation is there was a lack of a denominator. So the study's purpose is not to describe incidence <clears throat> or percentage but rather just to describe those findings seen in three large revision centers. The study strength is it's a multi-center data set, large study numbers. It's accepted methodology for a number of different type of study uh, outcomes that use this methodology. It's consistent with clinical observation and consistent with previous reports. So in conclusion of this study, risk factors for femoral failure were the direct anterior and direct lateral, and the risk factors for instability were direct anterior and posterior with the numbers available. But only the direct anterior approach was associated with both instability and femoral failure. And so it calls for further studies and registries, one of which we'll look at later on in the presentation. The Stanford study that was published near the same time of, uh, of ours in the Journal of Arthroplasty sort of corroborated our findings, if you will. They looked at 130 revision hips, 30 through the direct anterior approach, 100 not through the direct anterior approach. In the meantime, revision was three years in the DAA group compared to 12 years in the non-direct anterior approach group. And what that group found was that aseptic loosening for femoral stem uh, was statistically greater in the direct anterior approach group, approximately three times the other group. So we think there's at least some, uh, some support for our findings by another institution that exists in the literature as well. Thank you. Well, thanks, Michael. That's a, <clears throat> a very clear presentation, and thank you for uh, finishing on time. I'm going to ask Anthony Younger to uh, provide a focused commentary on the, uh, on the previous paper. So, uh, Anthony, can you go ahead, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Waddell, uh, Dr. Swinkowski, and JBJS. And I'd like to congratulate Michael for an excellent paper that's certainly worthy, worthy of uh, further investigation. Here are my financial disclosures, which are not relevant. The purpose of this study, as Michael said, was to examine whether the DAA approach, the direct anterior approach, had a greater percentage of early femoral failure. 
if you look at this study critically, it was 342 revisions of which 129 were the direct anterior. But it's important to point out that these were sent to referral centers, two of which, Rothman Institute and Ortho Carolina, are known for their expertise in revision surgery, particularly the DA approach. So when you look at this study, you're seeing patients that are sent in, possibly from the community, into referral centers. So this is a very subset of patients that may have problems with the direct anterior approach. These are all known for the revision experience with the DA approach. And if you look at the statistics of the patients that were sent, you had 69 surgeon referrals over four years. That averaged out to five referrals per doctor or 1.3 years. And it raises the question of the experience of the community and how they are adapting to this type of uh, procedure. The bottom line is we don't know the incidence, and I think Michael pointed this out. There were 122 early femoral failures, 51% DAA, but we don't know the denominator. We're just looking at the numerator. We saw that periparsetic fractures were the same, were same, were the same between groups, but the loose femur might be higher. And again, the question is, if you had a loose femur, would you send it off to the center that had expertise, but a periparsetic fracture, you might be capable of putting a plate on or dealing with that. Gets down, I think, what it comes down to is the learning curve. We talk about this all the time, the learning curve. The learning curve is probably 50 cases. It may be more or less, depending upon the experience of hip surgeons. And the question is, when you look at these studies, people are always introducing new implants. You look at the multitude of implants that are presented by patients, by surgeons, and their results. And you see a lot of different implants are presented. And the question is, are the implants affecting the result rather than the surgical approach? And this has been seen in various studies. This is, as Michael pointed out, has been seen in other studies, the Stanford group. But again, the Stanford group, again, was a referral institution looking at 30 cases, looking at aseptic loosening as a common issue. But again, they were a referral center, sent in patients, were sent to them because of their expertise. The bottom line is the DAA is safe, and I think multiple prospective randomized studies have shown safety. The advantage is being quicker recovery, cup accuracy. You definitely can use an x-ray machine properly, lower dislocation rate, and I believe you can equalize the leg length either through clinical examination or through x-ray evaluation. What about the learning curve? Is this ethical? And I think Schwartz in this study in 2016 said, yes. This is safe, it is ethical, because there are less complications. There is better placement of the cup, and that has been demonstrated in the literature. And you can use an x-ray adequately, safely, uh, with a great degree of um, accuracy. I think when you look at uh, this, this quote uh, talking about what I think is the wisdom of orthopedics, the soundness of action that requires judgment, experience, and knowledge, Dr. Moscow said this statement in 2011, and I think it's appropriate to the DA approach. He said, quote, my position is not whether we should embrace this technique, the direct nature approach, or any other new technique, but rather how they should be introduced. My opinion is that the DA is safe. I continue to do this. I think this is an excellent paper, and I think this is worthy of further investigation, but I do not think that this paper has demonstrated that the DAA, the direct anterior approach, has a higher femoral fa failure than any other hip approach. Thank you. Well, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, Dr. Unger. That's uh, a very precise um, summary of the paper, and uh, I think you've raised some good questions about the, uh, the content of the paper. I wonder if I could ask you a question. What do you think um, about how new techniques and technology should be introduced into the orthopedic community? Is there a problem around the way we've introduced the direct anterior approach? Is there a better way to do this? What do you think? Uh, yes, I, I think that's a very good question. And I do think that there are better ways to doing it. And I think that although industry has made major uh, accomplishments and uh, changes in the way they've introduced new technologies through courses and so forth like that, but I think we can do better. Uh, I think that uh, certainly my experience with this is that one should certainly go to at least one or two cor courses, work on cadavers for an extended period of time, probably get a mentorship or a preceptorship, and most importantly, don't have 
so many different variables going on at the same time. Don't use a new prosthesis. Don't use a new approach. Try to keep things simple uh, and start with the easy patient. And I think that will be a, a recipe for success. And I think if we try to, if you think about, you know, when you introduce a new airline, what the airlines do in terms of getting a pilot to understand how a 787 works versus a 747, it's tremendous amount of training. And we've got to adapt that same sort of uh, thinking line uh, in the future. All right. Well, should there be um, some rule at the hospital level that says that you need to go off and do some additional training if, before you can do these procedures? I mean, is, is that our responsibility as orthopedic surgeons, or should we ask our hospitals to do it or our state medical boards? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this. This is. I, uh, I think. Yeah. Oh, this but, is uh, Tad Mabry. Just really so, quick, you know, I, I might. Uh, I was going to take a quick crack at that. You know, I think that one of the main things that one really has to do, I think, for any new technology, whether it's this approach or other things, would be to clarify your rationale for making a change. And so I think that if you uh, are experiencing a clinical problem that you feel might be addressed by whatever change you're making, uh, then I think you, you uh, Dr. Unger, laid out a number of very rational ways to try to approach that, to try to minimize the risk to the patient, uh, but I think you have to be honest with yourself about your rationale for making a change, uh, and if it's for uh, marketing purposes or other non-patient-centered uh, reasons, I think one really has to be, uh, um, uh, maybe think twice about that. Okay. Well, let me ask Michael, um, based on, on your paper and maybe other, other experiences that you've had, <laughs> Are there patients in whom the direct anterior approach should not be done? I mean, what are the contraindications to this approach based on what you've seen in this revision practice? Is there something that's consistent in the patient uh, population that would give me pause to, uh, to uh, offer this to a patient? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. It's multifactorial. I mean, I think every surgeon has to know their skill set. Um, I think the comments around not changing too many things at one time is appropriate. I think that a lot of people will avoid the morbidly obese or certain anatomical considerations, very challenging femoral anatomy, I think, based on this data. If you have really challenging femoral anatomy where you need really robust exposure, uh, maybe some pretty excessive scar tissue around the posterior aspect of the hip where you would have a hard time elevating the femur, I think those would be sort of rational considerations. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's absolutes, but I think it goes back to the fundamental question. Um, it, you got to be, as a surgeon, comfortable in making the, uh, the right decision for the patient. And this, this paper, I want to be clear, was not an incrimination of the direct anterior approach. I think that approach is an excellent approach and is performed by many on a regular basis. But I think it was trying to describe uh, what we were seeing in our practices and some pretty high volume revision practices and the data just speaks, you know, for itself, at least over that five year period. So well, one of our one of our listeners has asked a question specifically of you, and that is, do you perform the direct anterior approach yourself? Oh, do I? Uh, I have yeah. done it, but no, I, I'm a posterior approach surgeon. OK, routinely. So you tried it, tried it and didn't like it. No, it's not that they didn't like it. Again, it goes back to what Dr. Mabry um, had said. Was it solving a clinical issue in my practice? And the answer was it was not in my particular practice. Um, so I have a very busy practice. There's a lot of people who do it for a number of reasons, I think, and we've published some data on one of those being um, marketing, but um, I couldn't find it solving a clinical issue for me. Okay. Well, maybe I'll ask all of the, all of the speakers if I could have, uh, we have a couple of minutes here before we start the next talk. Um, you know, published papers suggest that there's no lasting benefit to this approach beyond about 12 weeks after surgery. Uh, is this very large move in North America in particular to the direct anterior approach the result of a need for reduced length of stay in the hospital? I'm just talking, asking the four of you. Or uh, is it driven more by marketing at the hospital level? What What do you think? Why don't we start? Uh, why don't we start with Tad? You know, uh, 
Uh, I think it's an excellent question. I think that, uh, again, there are a number of drivers uh, for adoption of any, of any particular technique, and I think uh, some surgeons are also high enough volume that they are very comfortable and facile with having multiple approaches that they would sort of customize to the particular patient and their anatomy and what their risks might be. So, for example, one might say, I have a patient with a very high dislocation risk, and so some uh, surgeons might be comfortable changing their approach. If they're routinely a posterior approach surgeon, they might choose a direct anterior or anterolateral based approach. Other surgeons might use other technologies like dual mobility, large heads, et cetera. And so okay. I think uh, it's, it's uh, individualized. Okay. Anthony, what do you think? Well, I, I came at this from a different angle, I guess. I adopted this. Uh, approach because I was concerned about dislocation. I know other people have come up with uh, various other approaches to it. Uh, I'm sort of a, an academic community orthopedic surgeon, I guess, so when people dislocate, I hear about it and I have to get up and deal with it. And uh, I really thought that this approach would reduce my dislocation rate, and I think the stuff that we published as well as other people is uh, sort of uh, supports that. The, the quick recovery thing, I think that's great, and I think the patients want that, and I think we can't be, uh, we can't sort of shrug that off and say we don't care about whether the patients recover fast or, or not. I think that that's important what our patients say, but my primary driving issue was uh, less dislocation and leg length issues, which I could deal with, I think, with a great degree of certainty. So those are the things that sort of drove me into this, not marketing. Uh, quicker recovery, like I said, yeah, I think it matters, and I think people are interested in it. I'm not, um, I'm not pushing off the, their issues with that, but it was really a dislocation issue for me. Okay, Michael. Yeah, I think there's been a number of things. You know, one of the things that we've seen recently is our fellowship uh, program. We've seen fellows that their jobs were contingent on a hospital mandating they do the direct anterior approach because it was a, you know, really nasty competition in that in a particular market. And so those sort of things have had profound effects on our profession. Um, I'm not saying that everybody does it because of that. I absolutely don't believe that. Like Tony articulated, you know, doing it for reasons in his practice that made sense for him clinically and for his patients. But I don't think we can sit here uh, with the elephant in the room being that it is heavily, heavily marketed and not acknowledge that. So... I think, again, it boils down to the physician, their own uh, introspective ability of what they can do surgically and what they feel is best for their patients. And there are many people who do the directing approach and do a great job for their patients. So that's not, that's not what this is about. Okay, good. All right, well, um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Dr. Mueller now to um, present uh, his work on um, the direct, what he's found, found uh, the direct anterior approach. This is a large registry study, and uh, as all of you know, registry studies can teach us a lot about uh, what happens in uh, orthopedic practice over a period of time uh, and involving a large number of surgeons. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Newt, do you want to go ahead, please? Thanks very much, and thank you for the opportunity to present the study. As you can see, I have no financial disclosure that are relevant. Uh, so... Uh, the reason we did this study in Norway was that there are other studies showing that the approach does indeed influence the revision rates. And as been discussed already, the, the minimally invasive surgery and the anterior approaches have been marketed that they increase the speed of recovery, cause less pain. But at the same time, there are uh, increased risk of complication in some studies and also the learning curve that's been debated already. So our question then was, how would this infect, affect the, the um, survival of the implants, and would it uh, cause a change in risk of revision? Uh, Norway has traditionally been a country where we used the direct lateral approach. Uh, before 2008, the ones that are marked here as anterior lateral are actually direct lateral that are misplaced. So there was a shift. <clears throat> excuse me, around 2008, 2009, where people started introducing the anterior approach because of studies uh, indicating that the direct lateral approach caused uh, limping, <clears throat> excuse me, and a lot of lateral pain. So after 
having uh, looked at uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery, you can see an, a very increase from 2008 and up until 2016. Right. <clears throat> it's flattened out in 2017, I think, but it's around 20%. This is the article where all uh, co-authors are listed, and uh, thank you to all of those. Uh, so the Norwegian Arthropathy Registry was, it was started in 1987 as a means to identify uh, implants that were not functioning properly, but it's been uh, also used for different um, uh, issues like uh, approaches. And each citizen in, citizen in Norway gets a unique identification number, so when you register the primary THA, the number is uh, registered, and if there's a subsequent uh, revision, the same number pops up. So you can follow all the citizens of Norway, all THAs, uh, which gives you a fairly good impression, not just of one practice, but an entire country and population. So the register has been validated, and now it's well over 95% of all the primary THAs in Norway are re reported to the register. Uh, the government is now uh, are in talks of making it uh, obligatory to report, so that might increase it even further. So what we did in our story, we looked, as I said, there were not, not much uh, minimally invasive surgery prior to 2008, so we included 2008 until 2013. The reason we only included uncemented stem was that we saw that 97% of all the femoral components used in uh, MIS surgery was uncemented, so we in, uh, included only those. That left us with half of all the, um, the THAs in the period, just uh, short of 22,000. As with all studies, we, we looked at the demographic data that are, were uh, registered, including sex, age, ASA grade, death, cup fixation, and the diagnosis leading to the THA. Uh, we also registered the head size, articulation, and uh, the duration of surgery. And as was mentioned, we looked at the two and five year implant survival using the Kaplan Meyer survival analysis, looking at the miss and chair, miss and chair lateral, and conventional posterior and conventional direct lateral approach. Uh, we used the Koch, Koch proportional hazard model uh, to uh, evaluate the relative risk of revision, adjusting for all the factors I mentioned with the age, sex, primary diagnosis, ASA grade, head size, cup fixation, type of articulation, and we grouped the, dura the duration of surgery into three categories. And we looked at the endpoints, any cause, where we used all four uh, approaches and compared them to each other for infection, dislocation, femoral fracture, or septic loosening, and any other cause, we combined the, uh, the misapproaches to get sufficient number for a proper analysis. Uh, it's been mentioned that when you introduce an approach, you might select your patient, so it could be a case mix bias. So to look at this and thinking that uh, you only use the MIS for the easiest patient, we try to do sensitivity anal analysis, including only the patients younger than 75 years of age, ASA grade one and two, only those with head size equal to or less than 32 millimeters, and only those with the diagnosis of primary osteo osteoarthritis as the cause of their THA. Also, the learning curve is a much talked about issue with the MIS surgery. So we tried to look if we could uh, see uh, any evidence of this in the register. So we, we excluded the first 50 done at each hospital. Uh, obviously, we do not know how many surgeons did the 50 first. It was one surgeon or 10, so it's a little uncertainty there. And we also checked different time periods within the five years to see if there was a change in the, um, the prevention rate. When we looked at uh, all the numbers, we had around 2,000 each of the MIS approaches, just short of 6,000 posterior approaches. And as I said, Norway has been a direct lateral country for many years, so just short of 12,000 THAs through the direct lateral approach. Apologies for busy slide. Um, as in the other studies, the, the, the younger patients were operated via the posterior and direct lateral approach in uh, this time period. Uh, there were very few 
uncemented cups in the anterior lateral group. And uh, with the cause of THA, there were um, more of those that had other causes than primary osteoarthritis in the posterior and the direct lateral group. Further were head sizes. The direct lateral group had the smallest heads, to put it that way, the, and uh, there were a mix of the, the surface articulation, ceramics, poly, metal. No metal on metal were included. So we had a mean, median follow-up of 4.3 years altogether, with the longest for the anterior and the direct lateral, 4.6 years. Anterior lateral was introduced later, the MISS version, so 3.3 years, and the posterior was 4.3 years. So the two and five year survival was uh, no significant difference between all four approaches. With the two year survival, 97% uh, or better for all approaches, and 96% or better for five year survival. So the relative risk for any cause, there were, as you can see, no significant difference between uh, all four approaches. Further, the relative risk of infection, we found that the direct lateral was twice gave twice the risk of being revised due to infection than the posterior or the MIS approaches. As I said, they were combined for this analysis. The um, dislocation rates, same as other studies, twice the risk with the posterior approach, with no difference between the direct lateral and the miss approaches. For all the other causes we calculated, there were no difference. So the sensitivity, uh, we, when we checked for, for the case mixed bias, there was no increased risk when we, when we excluded all the, uh, the, the ones I mentioned before. There was still um, an increased risk of infection with the direct lateral approach and even higher risk of um, a revision due to dislocation via the posterior approach. Obviously, with the, excluding the larger heads, this, this would be, uh, I think, what people would expect. We found no evidence of a learning curve in this study period. That could be due to, as I said, that the different surgeons or one surgeon did the 51st cases. So a few points for the discussion. Uh, there's a weakness that we only have on cemented stems. There are several studies, especially in older women, indicating that they do better with cemented stems. So we don't know if these findings translate over to cemented stems. It's a short follow-up, all early revisions. However, if you think that it's the approach that caused the revision, you would probably see those early. So that could be caught anyway. And it's a registered uh, study, so we have no clinical data uh, saying how the patients do. On the other hand, it's a large number of TSH from a country, a large population, no single practice. And there are not that many studies looking on the MIS surgery surgeries and revision. There are some, and some of those point in the same direction as ours. Uh, it's a worry that the direct lateral approach uh, leads to revision due to infection. Obviously, a registered study does not indicate why this could be. And it will be interesting to see if other studies can um, find similar uh, results. So our conclusion from what we looked at is that the introduction of the MIS surgery in THAs in Norway has not increased the revision rates or the risk of revision. Thank you very much. Well, th <clears throat> thanks very much. That's a, a, a very good study, exhaustive study, looking at a large number of patients, and uh, I think uh, provides some food for thought. So I'm going to ask Tad Mabry from the Mayo Clinic to give his uh, comment now on, on that paper. Ed, do you want to go ahead? Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to comment on this excellent paper uh, from our colleagues in Norway. As was mentioned, I thought it would be uh, helpful maybe to point out a little bit of uh, thoughts and uh, call out some specific details on the background and study rationale. Clearly, there's increasing use of so-called minimally invasive anterior and anterolateral approaches for total hip arthroplasty, which is true in our country and also true in Norway. Uh, 
And so the clinical question really is that, are these MIS approaches associated with an increased risk of revision following primary total hip arthroplasty? As was noted, this is coming from the Norwegian Arthroplasty Register, which is just a phenomenal resource for all of us. It was looking at almost 22,000 surgeries, obviously all in a contemporary period. But as was noted, this is only looking at uncemented stems, and it sounds like that really represented only about half of the cases that were performed over that same time period. And so we really are unable to make um, conclusions about whether or not this these approaches are changing the overall revision rate because we're only looking at whether or not it changes the revision rate in cases with uncemented stems. And again, there's some exclusion of the so-called learning curve, and one might argue that it would be very important if we're looking at complications to look at all cases that were performed. It's hard to understand why we would give a pass to any given procedure uh, for the learning curve if we're looking at complications. There was an excellent job using Cox proportional hazard models of trying to account for a number of known, specific, and clinically important variables. As was noted, most of these cases were performed through the direct lateral approach, and you can see the breakdown as noted. A smaller number of cases were through these minimally invasive anterior or anterolateral approaches. As was also noted, there was no difference in the risk of revision, again, only looking at uncemented stems for all-cause revision femur fracture, aseptic loosening, or those cases with unknown etiology driving that revision. There was an increased risk of revision for dislocation from the posterior approach, but I would add that the risk was only less than 1.5% at five years. So while the risk was higher with the posterior approach, the absolute risk was still relatively low. Similar findings with the direct lateral approach and infection. Although the risk was certainly higher in this approach, that overall risk is still less than 1.5% at five years. A number of study strengths, and again, the authors should all be commended for this excellent work. There was a large sample size from a validated registry. It accounts for multiple clinically important variables. It gives us all a better understanding of the pros and cons of the main surgical approaches in use today. But I think it's fair to say that some questions remain, and I think one of the outstanding things is that this group could answer some of those questions. I think question number one really relates to the expanded role of uncemented fixation. We know that uncemented fixation is associated with a higher risk of early revision in multiple studies, especially within certain patient subsets. And so one answerable question would be, how do these revision rates after the MIS approaches compare to the revision rate for matched groups? So if you took patients of similar age, bearing surface, indication for surgery, et cetera, and you added in those surgeries that had cemented or hybrid implant fixation, would there be an overall effect on the revision rate? I think that'd be an interesting question to try to answer. The second really goes back to that posterior approach dislocation risk. We know that the posterior approach is particularly sensitive to changes in femoral head diameter. And if you look at this table that was coming from the study, if you look at the posterior approach group, you can see that only about 10% of those cases had head size greater than 32 millimeters. And in my own practice, when I'm using the posterior approach, I would say that 10% or less of my cases have a 32 millimeter or less head size. I would say that 90% or so are at 36 millimeters and above. So I think that's an important consideration, and one, again, could certainly tackle this using their outstanding registry. What is the absolute risk of dislocation with larger head sizes when using the posterior approach? The current study looking at all comers would say that it's less than a percent and a half for posterior and about 0.5 to 0.75% for the other approaches. I don't know, but I suspect that that difference would be much smaller and maybe no longer clinically significant with the larger head sizes, but again, that would need to be proven. So I think that in, in my mind, I think some of the conclusions would be that we're all trying to figure out what is the ideal surgical approach. And I think it would be a few things. I think it would allow one to tackle a wide spectrum of hip conditions. I think the ideal approach would have the minimum number of contraindications. I think it would be appropriate if it would support essentially unlimited implant options that you could place in the correct position. I think you would want to minimize both short and long-term complications for the patient. And as always, you would want to promote early functional recovery.
I think further study would be needed to better define the specific conditions and patient populations that might be best suited to any one of the current surgical approaches. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for that, Tad. Um, I want to thank everyone for the great insights uh, that they've brought to this uh, particular issue, which, uh, as we all know, is very controversial now for the reasons that have been outlined. Well, I'd like to uh, I'd like to turn now to um, some of the uh, questions that the audience have uh, have submitted. Um, let's start with one ver fairly basic question. And I'll turn this open to the whole panel. Uh, is there a difference in when you allow your patients to start weight-bearing depending on the surgical approach? Let's not talk about the implant or the patient, but just the approach itself. Does that influence when you let them start weight-bearing? Uh, let's start with Michael. No, I let them all weight-bear as tolerated immediately, even when I did okay. the direct anterior approach. Both, whatever approach, they can weight-bear as tolerated. Okay. Anybody else uh, have a, have a different approach? Does uh, everybody let them wait there? Yeah. Doctor, what do you think? I let them wait there. Uh, there's no difference in terms of how the approach influences weight there. Okay. Good. Uh, Doctor Mullen, do you do the anterior approach? I do the anterior approach. Yeah, for ninety percent of the primary. Yeah. Okay. And uh, no difference. No difference, always full weight bearing and no restriction in movements. Okay, good. All right. Um, a second question that I think is very interesting with this particular approach and maybe isn't addressed as often as it should be is problems with uh, acetabular orientation. Now, is there an issue here that uh, that maybe is, is uh, underappreciated? We know that there's sometimes uh, talk of uh, psoas tendon irritation and so on. It seems to be a little more common with this approach. Um, why don't we start uh, with you, Michael? Uh, do you think that some of these patients that you saw in your study had uh, acetabular problems that were as significant as the femoral problems? Yeah, that didn't, that didn't necessarily bear out specifically in our study, but just as a revision surgeon, we see that occasionally. But I think that is regardless of uh, approach, to be quite honest. With highly porous metal shells, you really have to just make sure, if you're talking about iliopsoas impingement or making sure your cup is uh, properly antiverted, that you don't have exposed highly porous metal around some of the soft tissue. So I think that's really with any approach. Having said that, certainly if you are less than optimally antiverted, the tendency for that to occur may be a little bit more common. Okay. Can I call Anybody else? Yes, please. Yeah, we do a lot of cemented stems with the interior approach. There are some studies saying that there's a problem that you get too much cement on the medial side of the cup, so it'll it'll stand too proud medially, and this can cause tendon irritation. Um, but I think it's down to technique. If you get it sufficiently in medially and an e even cement mantle around the whole cup, it's not as much a problem as perhaps when you start out and not getting the cup correctly. Okay. Uh, I'm interested in that because uh, there's a, a tendency in North America, of course, to use cementless stems and cementless cups. And one of the arguments that's come up is that people feel it's a little unsafe, perhaps, to use cemented stems or cemented cups through the direct anterior approach. But uh, Newt, you obviously don't think that's an issue. No, no. I think if if you do the the, the approach in a correct manner and you you do the capsule release prior to to um, reaming and implanting the cup, I don't think it's an issue. We do cemented stems and cups through the interior approach. Okay, good. Um, let me doctor, ask. Doctor, uh, sorry, doctor, go ahead. Can I make, make a comment? Well, I I agree with Mike. I think that. You can get psoas impingement no matter how you put it in, anterior lateral, anterior, or posterior. But I do think that because the anterior, we tend not to antivert uh, as much as a posterior, there is a potential for you to potentially get a little bit of rubbing over the top if you're not careful. So I would, I would say I pay particular attention to looking at the anterior rim to make sure that there's no exposed metal, that I haven't accidentally put it in less antiversion than I really wanted it to be in. So uh, I, I do think you've got to be cognizant of that 
uh, in the answer approach, that you can get some impingement if you're not careful. Okay. Well, um, one of the questions that's been asked, uh, I think, is, a, is a interesting, and that is, do you tailor the approach, uh, surgical approach, for your patients to patient activity level? Uh, do the more active patients, uh, the ones that are maybe a little more physically active, still working or playing sports, are those the ones you tend to use the anterior approach for because you think it's more stable? And maybe use posterior approach for the older, less active patients uh, for whatever reason. What What do you think about that? Let's hear from the, the all four of you in that regard. Uh, are, you, are you selecting the patients for these different approaches based on activity level, or or not? Why don't we start with Michael? Yeah, I don't think this is a. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's only a you know a subgroup of of surgeons who are really selecting out based on certain factors. I think the majority of direct anterior approach surgeons do it in the majority of their cases, unless there's really some anatomical extenuating circumstance. Uh, I would venture to say the majority are doing it in greater than 90% of their cases. <clears throat> and same thing for posterior approach surgeons, probably right. even more, you know, 95%. So I, I, and secondly, I don't think it's activity related. We don't let, well, regardless of the approach, we let them go back as fast as they can. I think the Mayo Clinic data that has recently been published, or if it's not published, it's at least been presented, showing the time of difference of recoveries on average about four days different would show you that you can let either approach recover pretty quickly. Okay. Anybody else have a, uh, a contrary opinion? This is, uh, this, is, this is Tad. I was, I was just going to say, I think from a... Uh, you know, personally, I think the uh, I do probably 85% uh, or so uh, posterior approach, and the remainder would be direct lateral. And I myself look at it purely from a stability standpoint. So patients that I think are at increased risk for instability problems, whether it's from a cognitive issue, neurologic issue, uh, muscle problem, any of the sort of major risk factors for instability, I myself right. might might favor either direct lateral approach for that patient or uh, or and or using uh, some sort of adjunctive technology like dual mobility, it really wouldn't, uh, myself, nothing really changes, again, uh, to the other uh, physician's point uh, in terms of uh, anticipated end-stage activity. It's really, uh, my, in my own hands, I, I'm just thinking about stability. Okay, well, there's, there's two uh, very similar questions here regarding range of motion or um, uh, hip restrictions, depending on the approach. So, uh, if you use a uh, posterior approach, um, uh, do you have specific hip restrictions for those patients, or do you use specific restrictions for any any of your patients? Um, uh, Anthony, why don't you uh, why don't you answer that? Uh, well, for the for the answer approach, I place very few restrictions on on patients uh, in the first four to six weeks, almost none. Uh, there's some twisting restrictions. I wouldn't let them go out and play golf for two weeks and twist on their hip. Um, so I still do occasional posterior approach. I would say 99% of my primaries are anterior. Occasionally I will do revisions posterior if I think they're very complicated, and I do restrict them and, and place a lot of restrictions on them. Okay. Uh, anybody else have uh, uh, specific hip restrictions now, or do you let all the patients get up and walk on their first post-operative day, or do you still use posterior uh, restrictions on posterior approach and abduction restrictions on anterolateral approaches with uh, bone or tendon work on the abductors. This is Miola. Uh, I'd use restriction for posterior approach, but maybe because I, I'd use the posterior approach either for a revision or if there's any metal that needs to be removed before doing the approach. So that, that'll be a special case, not, not the standard DHA, I'll always do that via the interior approach, and okay. I have no restrictions then. Yeah, this is Michael. Maggie. For a posterior approach, we use, we just have them avoid the crazy extremes um, of flexion and internal rotation. Outside of that, we have no restrictions on their activity and encourage them to get back to whatever they want to do as soon as they can. Okay. Well, what about with the direct anterior approach, those of you who are doing it, have you uh, seen any problems with quadriceps function, either as a consequence of uh, partial or complete femoral nerve palsy, 
or as a result of uh, some work on the uh, quadriceps at the, uh, the insertion above the acetabulum. Any issues there with knee function or knee instability or, uh, or anything like that suggesting that, uh, that there may be a problem? Um, I guess we, we keep, sort of keep picking on you, Anthony, because you said 95% of your practice was direct <laughs> anterior approach. But uh, any others want to weigh in on this? Uh, maybe, Michael, did you uh, see I, any of this in your revision uh, patients? I think um, Tony's probably the best one to answer, to be honest yeah. with you, with all the direct anterior okay. approaches. I mean, okay. I, I think this is, this is Dr. Unger again. Um, I think it's it's a theoretical advantage, and I think we're all aware of the fact that the femoral nerve is is I would say out of yeah. bounds uh, in the anterior approach, uh, but obviously it could be injured. I've never had one. I've never seen one. Uh, that doesn't mean that it happens. It doesn't. I'm sure it happens. Um, sure. So I, I think that you know it's like the sciatic nerve. I mean, I I would say you probably get the sciatic nerve more than you do the anterior. Uh, approach yeah. affecting the femoral nerve. That would be my guess, but I don't think anybody's really looked at that yet. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, this is Mjolland again. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we had a few femoral nerve palsies, but fortunately all of them have returned to full function within, I'd say, three months. This is a transient thing compared to the ischiatic with the direct lateral, which in our practice have been more permanent. Well, yeah. for those and of I, you that don't do the, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Ten. Jim, I just want to make a comment. I think that when you boil all this down and all the data down, all the reports, it really has to do with the fundamentals of anatomy. I mean, if you come from the front, there are certain structures that are more likely to be injured if you get out of bounds. The femoral exposure, probably even, Tony, most people would acknowledge that the femoral exposure may be a bit more challenging in that approach, and therefore... Our study showed that maybe if you be careful to not undersize the femoral component, it could loosen. You know, be be mindful of that challenging aspect of the procedure. Same thing for the posterior approach. Static nerves closer. The 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 downside is potential instability. So be mindful of that when you're doing the posterior approach. And I think that's really the take home message about these approaches. Be mindful of the and the anatomical considerations and the risks really fall right in line. With that, with those anatomical boundaries. Well, for those, here's a good question. I think for those of you, including myself, that don't do the anterior approach, what what do you uh, say to a patient that requests an anterior approach if you, in fact, are not comfortable doing it? Do you knock them out of it? Do you do it anyway? Do you send them to one of your colleagues? What? How do you handle that? Handle that? Well, this is Michael. I guess I can answer that because I do uh, majority post your approach. I offer them um, the opportunity to go somewhere if they're adamant about it, uh, but I fully disclose that I'm not an expert at the direct anterior approach. Um, but I also offer the, of the data that, that exists, which is an um, incremental improvement in activity level on average about four to five days if you look at the excellent Mayo study, and then they can decide. All right. Do you have a partner that does anterior approaches? We have an, we have plenty. It's a big market. We have plenty of surgeons who do direct anterior approach. Okay. Many to so, choose from. It's not, it's not an issue that the patient can't get care if they uh, if they don't to go along with what you said. No, that's no, not they always can get true. In some some communities, you know, they they this office, this is not offered by other surgeons. So sure, that's sure. that's a good question. I think you know what are, what are you going to do with that? Um, uh, Tad, question. I, was, I think. Sorry. Go ahead. No, so I'm so sorry. Just really quick, I would say very similar to what uh, what Michael said. Uh, I and kind of what he had talked about before a little bit too. I just talked to patients about realistically, you're you're sort of trading complications, and so each approach has some unique facets to it. And uh, there's not a free lunch that's uh, complication free. So I talk them through sort of some of the data as I understand it, and uh, and patients that are highly motivated to pursue direct anterior. I've got. Uh, a couple partners who are fabulous at that as well, and so they, off they go. Okay. I have a quick question for everyone. We're, we're going to have to wrap this up in just a minute or two. But we have an interesting question relating to the finding of increased infection rate with direct lateral uh, approaches. Uh, do, do the others uh, have any uh, experience with this? 
in their uh, practices or revision practices that there is a difference in infection rate between the, uh, the, the uh, approaches? I was surprised to see that, I must say. We didn't find that in our, in our revisions. No, no. Independent uh, Anthony, any, have you seen that or a Tad? Anything I, that? I, I've done very few of those, and I cannot see really a rationale why that would be the case. Right, right, okay. All right. This is Tad. You know, one thing, I, I have no uh, proof for that, but it would be an interesting uh, study, I guess, is a lot of, uh, depending on how you repair the abductors uh, and obviously how you take care of them during the case, I think if you do uh, damage them severely, I think that muscle damage and muscle necrosis would be a setup. But I also, I wonder about the use of heavy non-absorbable suture, like heavy braided suture for abductor repair. Uh, depending on how you do it, I think that that can, in some cases, be a little bit of a nidus for infection, uh, and it would be something that would, would have to be studied. But that was, as I looked at that data, obviously it's, it's rather unique. It's not a widespread finding, but that was one thought in terms of uh, how they're repaired and is that a risk. This concludes the first JBGS AudioCast. If you would like to watch the full webinar broadcast, please visit the JBGS YouTube channel on JBGS Media. We hope you've enjoyed this AudioCast. Thank you.